Hey, if you got a Bible, go ahead and open it up to John chapter 18. John chapter 18. And while you find your way there, give it up for Stu and the band. Thank you guys for leading us right there. Yeah, it's wonderful, wonderful. We're in a series uh, titled Lasting Moments. And we're looking at the last moments of Jesus' life and how those last moments, um, he meant for those last moments to be lasting moments in our lives, that they would, um, they would be the narratives by which we then live out our life in, in our day and time. And one of the things that Jesus teaches, uh, not in his last moments, but uh, as you find your way to John chapter 18 by way of introduction a bit, um, Jesus tells uh, his disciples, he says, listen, Uh, I want you to teach them uh, to obey all that I've commanded, Um, not just to teach what I've commanded. And and oftentimes what happens is um, we can fall into a trap of learning the Bible rather than learning to obey the Bible, which is different. Um, And in fact, Jesus tells us that uh, what we should do is teach people uh, how to obey all that I have commanded. And so some of us have had experiences in churches um, where um, it kind of uh, it, it, it's kind of like going to a baseball practice, and, and you got your glove and you got your bat um, and you're ready and you're ready for everything and you're ready to do it, and then they just pull out the rule book and they're like, "All right, we're just gonna sit here and we're just gonna talk about the rules of the game for an hour and a half." And then you go home and it's like, "Well, I didn't. I learned the rules of the game, but I don't know. I didn't really." I didn't really learn how to actually put those rules and the concepts into practice and actually do the things. And so a lot of times some of our experience can be then that where there's a lot of substance, but there's very little application. And maybe some of you have been in churches like this um, where kind of what ends up happening, I'm, I'm throwing out caricatures caricatures here. Um, it's like you got, you, you got a real big fat head of, and Bible knowledge, but like application, you're just like a really unkind person. You know, it's like, you can tell me all about the Bible, but living out like Jesus is, is not really. And I'm setting up two dichotomies. Oftentimes it's somewhere in between. Uh, and then sometimes uh, some of our experiences is going to church and um, it's like going to practice where it's, it's just chaos and there are no rules. It's like, all the kids just get out there. It's like, um, it's like baseball practice with four-year-olds, you know? It's like, ah, it's like how many rules can they actually understand? Just throw them out there, kind of try to catch the ball, go about it, right? And so there's lots of application, and oftentimes it's very creative and fun application. There's not a lot of substance. Um, and so the goal is that we would find somewhere in the middle, that we would have creative application, but also substance, that we would know the rules of the game, but also know how to apply the rules of the game. And and that's exactly what Jesus was getting at when he said, teach them to obey. Teach them to obey. It's not just, my goal up here this morning is not just to teach you God's word, it's to teach you to obey God's word. And so hopefully I'm going to show you some creative ways to apply the realities of what happened in Jesus' last moments uh, this morning. That's my goal, okay? Does that sound good? If you found your way to John chapter 18, say word. That was weak. There's way more people in here than that. Say word. All right. Let's get into the Word so the Word can get into us. We're going to start reading uh, at verse 28. John chapter 18, verse 28. Then they led Jesus from Caiaphas to the governor's headquarters. It was early morning. They did not enter the headquarters themselves. Otherwise, they would be defiled and unable to eat the Passover. You should highlight that in blue because that's sad. So Pilate came out to them and said, What charge do you bring against this man? They answered him, If this man weren't a criminal, we wouldn't have handed him over to you. Pilate told them, You take him and judge him according to your law. It's not legal for us to put anyone to death, the Jews declared. They said this so that Jesus' words might be fulfilled, indicating what kind of death he was going to die, meaning on a cross lifted up, not by stoning. Jews executed by stoning. Romans executed by cross, lifting up. It was prophesied Jesus would be lifted up. Then Pilate went back into the headquarters, summoned Jesus, and said to to him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered him, Are you asking this on your own, or have others told you about me? Very key question there. I'm not a Jew, am I? Pilate replied. Your own nation and the chief priest handed you over to me. What have you done? Notice Jesus doesn't answer that question. He goes back to the original question. My kingdom is not of this world, said Jesus. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would fight 
so that I wouldn't be handed over to the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom is not from here. You say a king then, Pilate asked. Are you, you are a king then, Pilate asked. You say that I am king, Jesus replied. I was born for this, and I have come into the world for this, to testify to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth listens to my voice. What is truth, Pilate said. After he had said this, he went out to the Jews again and told them, I find no grounds for charging him. You have a custom that I release one prisoner to, to you at the Passover. So do you want me to release to you the king of the Jews? They shouted back, not this man, but Barabbas. Now Barabbas was a revolutionary. This is the word of the Lord. Let's pray. Father, we love you. We thank you. Speak to us through your word. Open our hearts and minds to the truth. And may we receive it and let it change us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Pilate asked the question, what is truth? Great question. Great question. It's a question that is still up to debate in our modern world and in the world that we have. And here's, here's the thing that we would believe as followers of Jesus. Um, we would believe that there is truth. Um, and it's not arbitrary. It's not arbitrary. It can, it can be known. It can be known. And in, in fact, the Bible um, is very clear, very clear on this, that we... As followers of Jesus, we actually have a reason to believe what we believe. Uh, and, and that reason is that it's the truth. Um, here's, a, here's a couple of Bible verses. Go ahead and throw up the next slide. First Peter chapter 3 says this, But in your hearts regard Christ the Lord as holy, ready at any time to give a defense to anyone who asks for you a reason for the hope that is in you. There's a reason we have a hope. There's a reason. We can reason it out. We can think about it logically and come and, and communicate the reason for the hope that we have. Go to the next one. That's Col this is Colossians 4, 6. Let your speech always be gracious, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how you should answer each person. You should be able to give an answer to why you believe what you believe. The next slide, Philippians chapter 1, verse 7 says, Indeed, it is right for me to know this way uh, about all of you. To think this way about all of you, because I know you in my heart, and you are all partners with me in grace, both in my imprisonment and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel. See, Paul says he has the ability to give an, a, a defense and confirm the message that he is teaching is true. Next one. Jude 3 says this, Dear friends, although I was eager to write to you about the salvation we share, I find it necessary to write appealing to you to contend for the faith that was delivered to you by the saints once for all. Faith is uh, communicated in two different ways. Um, in the Bible, faith is communicated as the actual belief and the belief system. Okay? So it is the context is sometimes used about the belief that you have, and other times it is talking about the belief system that you hold. Here it's talking about the belief system that we hold and that it is true, that you can contend for it. And so as we ask the question, what is truth? It's a great question Really? So the Bible demands that we understand and know what we believe, and reason demands it. Socrates said this, the unexamined life is not worth living. And we would add, as followers of Jesus, we would say this, the unexamined life of faith is not worth living. Our life of faith should be examined. So let's answer this question, what is truth? Number one, truth about reality is knowable. Truth about reality is knowable. This, this object here in front of me is a podium because it corresponds with reality. We call it a podium because that's what it is. So truth is to speak the truth is to tell it like it is as it corresponds with reality. That's called the correspondence theory of truth. Right? So the skeptic will say, there is no truth, and we could respond. These are very simple tactics, okay? But what we need to learn is be able to visualize and see and detect um, self-defeating statements. Um, and to say, this, as the skeptic would, there is no truth, or truth doesn't exist, we would say, is that true? Right? It's, it's making a claim that's true while saying that nothing is true. 
It's very simple. It's very simple. The, the other skeptic would maybe say, well, yeah, yeah, I'm not going to say that there is no truth, but I'm going to say that you can't know truth. And the question is, is that true? Is that a true statement? Self-defeating. It's actually the basis for which it has is, is uh, it falls to its own test. It falls to its own test. Some skeptics would say this, you should doubt everything. And the question then would reply, reply back to them would be, do you doubt that? Right? These are self-defeating arguments. The truth about reality is that it's knowable. Some would say that truth is not knowable, and the truth, um, uh, the truth, that truth is not knowable, is the truth the skeptic claims to know. Right? You following? These are self-defeating statements. We have to learn to be able to see them. So, one in order to even declare that truth is uh, that there is no truth or you can't know truth or you should doubt everything, you have to declare some sort of truth and accept that truth exists and that it's knowable because you know it. And so the reality is truth, truth is knowable. It's what corresponds with reality. It's telling it like it is. Now, if that's true, truth about reality is knowable, then the opposite of truth is false. The opposite of truth is false. So the skeptic would say, well, all religions are true. All religions are true, right? And it's the old adage about an elephant and like one grabs the ear and is like, oh, well, the, they're blind, okay? It's the six blind guys and they're touching an elephant and one grabs the ear and says, this is, a, this is a fan. One grabs the side and says, it's a wall. One grabs the tail, says it's a rope. One grabs the leg, says it's a tree. One grabs the tusk, says it's a spear. One grabs the trunk and says it's a snake, right? But here's, here's the truth about that. Um, the problem is um, that the narrator claims to know all truth, that, know that knows that it's an elephant. And so once again, it's a self-defeating statement. The opposite of true is false. That, the, the idea here and the concept is, is follow with me. I'm going to get to the Bible here in just a minute, okay? But keep following. I'm trying to give you practical advice that will actually help you as you navigate life. The opposite of truth is false. It's the law of non-contradictions, right? Like two things can't be, two things that are opposite can't be the same at the same time in the same sense. That's impossibility. That's impossible. Opposite ideas cannot be true at the same time in the same sense. And so some will say, oh, well, everything's true. It's like, it's your truth, my truth, that whole deal, right? There's a medieval philosopher who had a very um, a good solution for this, uh, 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 Avis, Avisnina, I think is, his, is, is the way you promise it, pro, pronounce it. He said this, everyone who denies the law of non-contradiction would be beaten and should be beaten and burned until he admits that to be beaten is not the same as not to be beaten and to be burned is not the same as being burned. Right? Because guy had it, it nail on the head right there. It's real easy to say that everything when you got it going, when everything's going good, you know. But uh, when you're getting beaten and burned, uh, you know that um, the, the opposite of that is not true at the same time as that fact being happening, being beaten and burned. So if you know someone, here's the deal. So if you know somebody who believes um, that just uh, all truth is relative, here's what you can do. You can kick them in the shin. All right? Then they'll punch you in the nose. And when you kick them in the shin, first you ask them, is kicking you in the shin the same as not kicking you in the shin? And they will say, I'm going to punch you in the nose and then reply to you, is punching you in the nose the same as not punching you in the nose? And then both of you have proved the law of non-contradiction to yourselves. Okay? So number one, truth about reality is knowable. If that's true, then the opposite of truth is false. And the law of non-contradiction says two things that are opposed to one another can't be true in the same sense at the same time. So then, we can know truth, and we know that there's something opposite of that. So then the question comes, is the, theist, is the theistic God, does he exist? Does he exist? Three things. Three things that we can prove that the theistic God uh, exists. It's at least reasonable, most reasonable. The universe had a beginning. Everything had a beginning, and everything that has a beginning has a cause. That's the second law of thermodynamics in the universe. If energy is expanding, imagine if I set a, uh, an hourglass, ain't that what that, yes, an hourglass up here and flipped it over, um, the sand would be drifting from the top 
uh, portion to the bottom portion uh, according to time. So the moment I flipped it, it began, and it is now dissipating, and eventually the sand will go all the way. So if we can look at a closed environment like an hourglass, which is our cosmos, and we can see that energy is dissipating, then the universe could not have existed for eternity. It could not have existed for all time, right? Because energy is depleting, and that's exactly what's happening. So it had to have a beginning, and every, if there was a beginning, then there is, a call, there is causal for that. One, one agnostic wrote this, Robert Gasparol, he said this, Now we see how the astronomical evidence leads to a biblical view of the origin of the world. The chain of events leading to man happens suddenly and sharply at a definite moment in time in a flash of light and energy. There, what I ha there are what I and anyone would call supernatural forces at work, and it's and is now scientifically proven. It's scientifically proven that supernatural means created the universe. You can't. We, it's not even arguable. So if if the, if the, there was a beginning, then there had to be a beginner. The second thing is life is, has incredible design. This is the te teleological argument. The, the, the deal is, man, the universe is infinitely complex, and complexity is not accidental. It's not accidental. Uh, uh, imagine if you walked into your kitchen, and uh, you had the, uh, the alphabet cereal, and it was spilled out on the, on the, on the uh, table, and it said, um, uh, hey, son, I need you, or daughter, because I have daughters. Hey, daughter, uh, Eleanor, I need you to take out the trash. Um, none of us would walk in there and be like, man, the wind or the, the, the air conditioner must have turned over the box and, and it just so happened to blow in such a random way that it produced a message to tell my daughter to take out the trash. None of us would say that. If, if something is designed with incredible intricacies, then there must be a designer. There's two different causes. There's natural cause and there's intelligent cause, right? You can think of natural cause like the Grand Canyon, okay? Over time, natural forces, whether you believe it was a massive flood or it happened over thousands of years, it doesn't really matter. Natural cause, okay? Boom, natural cause. Then there's intelligent cause versus Grand Canyon versus Mount Rushmore, all right? No amount of natural causes is gonna put four faces in the rocks. That was intelligent design. Intelligent design, right? It's the difference between a sand dune and a sand castle. Amen? Y'all tracking? If it takes intelligent design today, then it, then it would have in the past. This is a principle of uniformity, okay? A cause in the future must have the same cause in the past or, or like causes. And here's the deal. People will say, here's, here's one of the arguments. Oh, like we came from a one-celled organism. It was just very simple. The problem is a one-celled organism scientifically is not simple. A one-celled organism, this is what they'll say about it, has a thousand sets of encyclopedias of information in it. So let's just, let's just pretend for a moment and accept the one cell or uh, an evolution argument. Like, where did that one bit of a thousand uh, um, copies and, and encyclopedias worth of information come from? If you want to boil it down to the simplest thing. Carl Sagan said this, if we could get one single message from space, it would prove intelligent life. We have 20 million volumes of information in the human brain. Maybe we should just look to us and see the created order and how intelligent it is. Albert Einstein said the harmony of natural law reveals an intelligence of such superiority that compared with all the systematic thinking and acting of human beings is utterly insignificant reflection. Utterly insignificant. All of our thinking and acting summed up, the sum total of our actions and thinkings as a human race is utterly insignificant in reflection. So, life is incredible, life has incredible design, and there is a moral law. Laws have law givers. You can't know. People will, people will say, oh, well, you, you, there is no moral standard, but then they will decry, decry injustice. But you can't know justice without, or you can't know injustice without justice. Right? And they're like, oh, and they'll try to go into some sort of intricately worked out thing. Here's the deal. Um, uh, we know that Mother Teresa is better than Hitler. Yes? Yeah, we would all say, yeah, we would nod our head and somebody would be like, well, I don't know. And it's like, here you go. Uh, which one would you let babysit your children? Okay, bring it to brass tacks. There you go. 
You, you, we all accept that there is something called justice. Now, we can, we can argue the particulars of all that, but if, if, if you will declare injustice, then there is justice. There is justice. C.S. Lewis said this, the moment that you say one set of ideas is better than another, you are in fact measuring them both by a standard saying the one of them conforms to that standard more nearly than the other. But the standard that measures two things is something totally different from either. There must be an objective moral law or we could not make statements like Mother Teresa is superior to Hitler. It's just true. So the reality is God exists, he's super powerful, he's super intelligent, and he's morally perfect. Amen. Period. So, Pilate, what is truth? We just answered it. So as we jump into the text, here's what I want us to see. In verse 28, it says this, They did not enter the headquarters themselves, otherwise they would be defiled and unable to eat. Do you see the pride in this? They wouldn't be able to eat the Passover. I, here's, here's point number one, okay? Our pride and arrogance will lead to a great failure. It will lead to a great failure. That's the truth. Picture this. These guys, they want to that afternoon, that evening, eat the Passover meal. So they don't want to go into Caiaphas' um, area because it's a place, or into uh, Pilate's area because it will make them unclean. The high priest and the leaders... Were the, think about this. They were the ones who evaluated and determined that a lamb was sufficient for the Passover sacrifice. Now they're sending the actual lamb in there and defiling him while they're sitting back and saying, we got to stay clean. The pride and arrogance that they have, they send Jesus in to Pilate, and they don't even have the wherewithal and the willingness to do it themselves. Their pride and arrogance has blinded them to the reality of what's actually happening in this moment. They're doing their task of evaluating and determining whether a lamb is sufficient. They're actually doing that right now with Jesus in, a, in an ironic way. They're delivering up the lamb to be sacrificed. Here's the truth. The wisest person in the room is the one who's willingly, consistently ready to learn. That's Proverbs chapter 1. The humble postures themselves in a way that says, maybe there is something here that I am not aware of, yet still confident in what they do know. Careful, because some will take your... When you, when you begin to be confident in what you do know, but also be open to learn, and maybe there's something that you're not aware of and receive that, and to learn but still stand firm in what you do know and what uh, God has revealed to you over time and through your, through your study and through your knowledge and, and through your competency. Careful, some will take that confidence as arrogance and we have, to be, we have to be very careful not to portray it as that. Second point, we find it in verse 30. It says, they answered him, if this man weren't a criminal, would, it, would we have handed him over to you? Here's the deal. Point number two, we seek those who affirm our predeterminations. Oftentimes when we go to a judge, now I'm not talking about a normal judge. What I'm talking about is when we go seek counsel, when we go seek counsel, often what we do is we just find the people who are already and going, who are already ready to affirm what we've already decided to do. We just want, we want somebody to put the stamp on it. We don't want to be challenged. Hey, 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 pilot, pilot, we're not here for you to actually judge Jesus rightly. We've already took care of that, bro. We just want your rubber stamp, bro. And so oftentimes in our lives, that's the kind of ways we live. It's a very dangerous place to find yourself seated around a table with a bunch of yes men who actually won't challenge the most important decisions of your life. We don't actually want to hear testimonies and make a judgment. The judgment's already been made. We just want someone else to execute it. I want to do what I want to do, and I want to do what I've decided to do. I just don't want to hold the responsibility, or I want to be able to blame this place later and say, well, they said it was good too. I want someone I can blame. I want a scapegoat. Isn't that ironic? They're looking for a scapegoat, and that's exactly who Jesus is, the irony of all this. They don't even know what's partaking in these moments that Jesus is willingly giving up his, his life for them. Ironically, Jesus is positioning himself intentionally to be that very scapegoat. 
So many of us bow to expediency. Quickest, fastest thing to solve the problem in this moment. We seek those who affirm our predeterminations. Our pride and arrogance lead to great failure. And here's another question. Pilate says, what is truth? The real question is, who is truth? What Pilate didn't realize is that truth was standing right before him. Truth isn't just concepts and ideas, although it is that. The reality is concepts and ideas can only be communicated, and if they are communicated, then they come from a person. So the real question is, who is truth? Who is truth? Well, the truth is this. Since God exists, as we've already explained through the first three points earlier in talking about what is truth, then miracles are possible. Miracles are possible. The skeptic would say, I can't believe the Bible because there's miracles. And then you ask the question, well, give me one of the miracles. Well, how do you turn water into wine? Let me tell you. All right. Um, Water evaporates, goes up into the sky. It forms a cloud in some crazy, miraculous way. It rains. It goes into the ground. Uh, this thing called a vine, a grapevine to be specific, sucks up that water into the vine. It produces grapes, and then those grapes become wine. There you go. Water to wine. Jesus just sped that process up real quick like that. See, the point is you, you're, we're witnessing miracles every day. We just don't have eyes to see, as the Bible would say. Since God exists, miracles are possible. And if miracles are possible, then, we can, then miracles can actually confirm a message from God. C.S. Lewis said this, If we admit God, you must admit miracles, and you have no defense against it. Right? If you accept Genesis 1 and 2, that God created life, uh, it's not a stretch. Even in the, the small miracle is the resurrection. If, if Jesus can speak life into existence and breathe life into a clump of, uh, of dirt, then what is it to just raise the dead? It's not a miracle at all, really, in one sense. And at another sense, it's completely miraculous. And here's the deal. All throughout this book, miracles are testifying and confirming a message from God. You say, yeah, well, I disagree with that book. I don't think it's reliable. Well, the problem is the New Testament is historically reliable. It's, we have more manuscripts, earlier manuscripts, better copied manuscripts, more contemporary manuscripts, and more reliable manuscripts than any other document in, in uh, antiquity, than any other one. Fact is, you can't trust, if you can't trust the New Testament, you have to throw out all the history books because it's all built on less reliable evidence than the Bible. Substantially less evidence. Substantially. We have approximately 24,000 manuscripts in various languages from antiquity. And here's, here's the truth. You step into a, ca into a court, all you need is two witnesses that verify one another that validate a happening. We got 24,000. If you want to just talk about those who wrote the New Testament, we have eight or nine, depending on who you believe wrote Hebrews, validating the same exact stories. These were eyewitnesses. Luke wasn't an eyewitness, but he interviewed deeply. And listen, the people who don't even believe the Bible, they look at Luke as maybe the, the greatest historian that's ever lived in his time. He was an anomaly. Paul was a contemporary, and he had eyewitnessed the resurrection. And then, the truth is, this New Testament, the, these letters were written at a time when you could go and, like, oh, John wrote this. Let me go talk to John about it. And you could go find the man. You could go find the people who witnessed these things and, and validate it for themselves in those moments. But yet, our witness and our testimony 2,000 years later, eh, that's, more, that's more valid than theirs. Listen, just frankly speaking, get out of here with that. That's foolery. Furthermore, there's really embarrassing testimonies in this book. Right? Like there's some things you would leave out if you were trying to write things. Like, yeah, mm, no, don't put that in there. 
Jesus is, um, uh, Jesus is in need at his most vulnerable moment, and his maybe greatest disciple at that time, Peter, uh, just denies him and, and basically like uses profanity against a little girl. It's like, leave that story out. Nope, it's in here. Why would they do that? Because the grace of Jesus is good, and it covers a multitude of sins. So the truth is a person, and his name is Jesus. This is why Jesus would declare, I am the way, the truth, and the life. So here's what Jesus does in this story. He seeks the question behind the question because Jesus is wanting to get to the truth. He's wanting to get to the truth. Did you see in verse 34, Jesus answered, are you asking this on your own or have others told you about this? In other words, uh, are you a pawn of those religious leaders outside or are you asking this on your own? Are you actually inquiring about who I am? Jesus wants to get to the question under the question. Here's the deal. This is challenging. Elizabeth and I, uh, when we've gotten into our greatest heated fellowship, uh, it's when we're talking past one another. Neither of us uh, see the heart of the matter. She's saying things, but she's not saying what she means. And I'm saying things, but I'm not saying what I mean either. And we're just going right past one another. And the, con the, the resolution happens when we're like, oh, why didn't you just say that? When it clicks, that moment, when you look at your spouse and you're like, oh, man, I've really missed this whole thing. Like, I was on a whole different, I missed it. I wasn't seeing it like it really is. Communication is a challenging thing. This is why Jesus rolls in with this question. Hey, 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 are you just a pawn of the boys outside? Or are you asking if I'm really a king? Because the reality of the matter is that Jesus is presenting himself as a king to every person. And the problem is, is everyone is playing in this game of lies and truth. That's the truth. Satan's native tongue, the enemy, the adversary, the one who's against you, the one who opposes you, his native tongue is lying. Which means his tool and his tactic is lies. What he wants to do is get you to believe, you and me, get us to believe lies rather than truth. And we got to be able to see the self-defeating lies that the world and the culture that we live in will throw at us because they're good and they have really good communication tactics. But Jesus still stands the test of time and he's still the truth. That's what we used to say when I, when I played sports back in the day. There was a time when the short guy played sports, okay? And there was a time when we, here's what we would say, specifically in football, if, uh, like I used to... I used to play like backup quarterback and I only went in to run the option and I would go in and I, there were times when I would just cut it up, you know, it's in steps out, you got to cut it up and then you just get a guy who's five, seven gets waylaid by middle linebackers. That's what happens. You just stand up. And what we say is that is the truth. The truth is what runs into you when it's a lot bigger than you. It's telling it like it is. We used to tell it like it is when, we, when you see an athlete who was just substantially better than it. We say, he's the truth. Jesus is the truth. Verse 34, you also see Jesus bold and courageous. Jesus is bold and courageous. Hey, let me talk to the believers in, in the room for a minute. All right? if, if, you, if you don't follow Jesus, you're skeptic or whatever, like I hope that some of this has been helpful, but let me just focus in on believers right here. We got to get rid of the timid, shy, weak, non-existent engagement. Also, we have to get rid of the arrogant, prideful engagement. We live in a, a, a false dichotomy where it's either, it's either or. It seems like there's only two options out there. And the people who only get a voice are the people who say nothing or the people who are just arrogant and prideful in their engagements. Maybe there's a third option to engage reasonably with gentleness and boldness. 1 Peter 3.15, I read it earlier, but if you continue reading it, here's what it says. Do not fear what they fear or be intimidated. But in your hearts, regard Christ as Lord and holy, ready at any time to give a defense. I've given you six defenses, by the way, for the gospel already. Be ready to give a defense to anyone who asks you for the reason for the hope that is in you. Yet do this with gentleness and respect, keeping a clear conscience so that when you are accused, those who disparage your good conduct in Christ will be put to shame. I'll just leave that there. Jesus is bold and courageous, and so should we be. Back on track. 
Next point, logic is on the side of Jesus. They ask the question, are you a king? Jesus is the only one that actually gives a reasonable response to his position. Pilate just says, ah, what is truth? That's not reasonable. The, the, the um, religious leaders, what do they say? They say, uh, do you think we would have brought him if he wasn't a criminal? That's no defense of their position whatsoever. Here's what Jesus says in verse 36. He says, my kingdom's not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would fight. They would be outside with swords raining down on this place. They'd be going to town so that I wouldn't be handed over to the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom's not from here. The logic is on the side of Jesus. Jesus is the only one here giving a reason for believing. William Lane Craig calls this reasonable faith. Listen, your faith is not unreasonable. I've given you six reasons to have faith in Jesus. Every worldview takes faith. Frank Turek, an apologist, said this uh, and wrote a book titled this, I don't have enough faith to be an atheist. Every worldview, every worldview, every worldview takes faith to some degree. The question is, which one is most reasonable? And I would argue without a shadow of a doubt, the most reasonable worldview is the worldview that the Bible presents to us. I just don't think anyone can know what is actual truth. Mm. Here's what I would say to you. Just because we can't know all truth doesn't logically mean we should abandon the truth that we do know. It's not possible for us to know all truth, everything there is to know. But just because you can't know everything there is to know, that's not a reason, a logical reason in any way, shape, form to abandon what we actually can know. And here's the deal. We like to do this with religion and we don't do it anywhere else in our lives, in any other sphere or context of our lives. I don't know what the... I don't know if the weatherman's prediction is right, but if he says it's going to be 30 degrees, I'm going to grab some sleeves. Something as simple as that. We'll, we'll go. And yet we'll abandon all that we do know just because we can't know it all. That's just foolery and logic is on Jesus' side. Don't think for a second that it's not. Verse 36, Jesus talks about my kingdom. He says, I, he's, he's, he's declaring, I am a king. Listen, I'm a king. Kingdom, this idea of kingdom. Here's, here's what I want you to understand. Kingdom is something greater than ourselves. And every one of you, every one of you, to me included, we have a desire to be, to be a part of something that's greater than us, that gives us purpose, that gives us meaning, to, to wake us up out of the bed in the morning. And, and what that is, is it's the thing in which we give our allegiance to. And the world will tell you, give your allegiance to pleasure, careers, politics, business, sports, academics, philanthropy, stuff, fame, fitness, the list goes on. Every one of them, give your allegiance to those and you will be left wanting because these are kingdoms of this world. They're all about power, status, pride, me. But here's the problem. What we often think is that we're giving our allegiance to this thing, this pleasure, or this or that, whatever it may be. But the reality of the fact is every kingdom has a king, which means you're giving your allegiance to a person. At best, when you give your allegiance to something other than Jesus, you give yourself allegiance to yourself, and you and I are really bad gods. But also, the Bible would depict that as giving yourself and your allegiance to the adversary because he's the one who points you to, hey, just put your, you got it. What you say goes, man, don't listen to God. Got all those trees in the garden. He's trying to hold you back from this one. And it's the good one. You should get some of that. Every kingdom has a king. So in reality, the truth is, when we give our allegiance to something, we're giving it to a person. And, and the problem is, we have a lot of people who are pretty smart and talented and creative. Musicians to artists to influencers to intellects, 
Little Wayne to Jordan Peterson to Barack Obama to Albert Pujols to Richard Dawkins, and, and the list goes on. Well, I like, I, I, I like what he says. I like what she says. Or I like this thing. I like that thing. Listen, give your allegiance to Jesus. Amen. He's the king. Amen. Notice he says it's not of this world. My kingdom's not of this world, but it certainly is a kingdom that's in this world. It's not concerning itself. He, he, he's telling Pilate, listen, bro, like, I'm not, I'm not your enemy. I'm actually for you. My kingdom's not of this world. It's not like the kingdoms of this world. It wasn't founded by this world. The ideas that contain and form the boundaries of Jesus' kingdom, they're other than. They're outside of us. They, they would never come about. The teachings of Jesus would never come out by a mere mortal. We are prideful beings, and that's why no other, no other teaching set in any worldview actually aligns with what Jesus would say. It's otherworldly. It's because it was formulated and the ideas were conceptualized outside of us in a, in a like greater, set apart, holy, so far distinct from what it means to be a human. But then he offers those realities to us and says, here, I'll give you your spirit and show you how to live like this and give you grace to live like this. They're unlike anything in this world has ever seen, which is why it turned the world upside down while not being of the world in which it turned upside down. Do you hear that? The actual, in the Acts, it says that these men, these 11 men, go out and they spread the gospel and it turned the world upside down. How, how can a kingdom that's not in the world turn the world upside down? How can a kingdom not of the world turn the world upside down? It's because it's in the world. It's just not of it. It's something other entirely. Jesus makes the declaration in verse 37, I am the king of truth. Notice what he says his kingdom is. It's a kingdom of truth. He says, I was born for this. I've come into the world for this. Uh, real quick, just some teaching for you. Um, <laughs> humans are born. So why would he be redundant and say, I was born for this. I came into the world for this. Because these two things speak to his humanity and his divinity. He, he came into the world. You're just born into the world. Me, just born into the world. Jesus actively came into the world and was born into the world. He is human and he is divine. He is the king. This is a kingdom of truth. He testifies to the truth. Jesus' humility, he shows humility in becoming a human. He, he goes through the virgin birth, Jesus' life, Jesus' miracles. They're all a testifying. He says, I came for this. What? To testify to the truth. Jesus is saying, I am the truth. And my kingdom is a kingdom of truth. And so when that happens, we're all confronted with the question, what is the truth? Well, the real question is, who is the truth? And when you're confronted with Jesus as the truth, you got to make a decision you got to make a decision. Where does your allegiance lie? I've talked about what truth is and who truth is. Now I want to talk to you for a moment about what truth does. What truth does. Truth stands before religious leaders as they scream we want the revolutionary rebel who's a murderer instead of you and keeps his mouth shut for you and me he doesn't even attempt to defend himself the truth don't need defending when it's standing in front of you and it's accomplishing the truth the fact of the matter that's what truth does Truth when the Roman soldiers surround him and put a robe on him and put a crown of thorns on him sits quiet and allows all the mockery and shame that you and I deserve to come on himself. That's what truth does. Because this is the truth and he is the truth. 
what truth does is after he's whipped and beaten, truth puts 75 to 80 pound piece of wood on his riddled and ruthlessly beaten back and walks as far as he can to accomplish what he's, called, he's been called to do for you and for me. Truth willingly allows um, Roman soldiers to drive nails in his hand. And while they're doing it, looks at them and says, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. That's what the truth does. That's what the truth does. The truth, why he's hanging on a cross, causes himself more pain to lift up, to take a breath so that he can speak and looks out and makes provision for his mother. That's what truth does. Truth, while he's in the most agonizing pain that one, he would, again, would lift up, scraping his ripped back, shredded back along that thorny piece of wood as he scrapes up that just to get a breath to look over at the man beside him who said to him, hey man, when you enter into your kingdom, like when you enter in, will you just remember me to, to give him and voice to him, today you'll be with me in the garden. That's what the truth does. And then the truth gives up his last breath for you and I. Gets put in the grave, and today we celebrate three days later. The truth shakes off grave clothes and steps out of the tomb. Because the truth is, he's the, he's the creator of life. He's the one who gave life. He can, he can resurrect when he wants. And he declared that no longer do we have to be bound by death, which is to be in the kingdom of the adversary, the kingdom of lies, and to live out the lies in our life. He said, I've now set you free from that. You too, you too can come out of the tomb, come out of the bondage, just like I have walked out. You can shake off the dead clothes of your life, which is a representation of, of all of the lies that you've lived and that you've believed and then brought about into your life. You can shake all that and you can take my story and it can be your story. I'm offering your story for my story. That's what truth does. And truth has a name, and his name is Jesus. And he has a kingdom. It's not of this world, but it's in this world. And we're living it out, doing our best to live it out. And Jesus comes to each one of us in this, in this moment and proves the greatest apologetic, maybe for the gospel, is the resurrection. Is the resurrection. The greatest defense for the gospel is the resurrection. Paul would say this. He would say, if, it, if the resurrection is false, if the resurrection is false, then we're to be pitied among more than any other human being. But the truth of the matter is, is the resurrection is true. Telling it like it is, that's the truth. Jesus is the truth. And so we all, we all, I don't care if you're a follower of Jesus or not, we all stand on Resurrection Sunday and we are left with answering the question, what is truth? Which is actually the question, who is truth? And when you answer that, Jesus, because he is the truth, you are, you are left with this reality. I have to figure out who I give my allegiance to. I'm going to give my allegiance to self or the adversary or I'm going to give my allegiance to the truth. And Jesus says, this is what it looks like to give your allegiance to the truth. Confess him as Lord. Lord means this, ultimate authority. No longer am I the authority. No longer is, is it my way or the highway. Jesus, you are now. Because you're the truth, it's your way in my life. And it starts in this moment. And then it builds from there. Every day we wake up and we confess it again. Jesus, not my way today, but your way. Not my way, but your way. Our mission is to bring the way of Jesus to every neighbor, neighbor and nation. This is it. So look at me. Don't look at me. Lean in. Don't let this be another Sunday, another Easter Sunday, maybe. You've been confronted with the truth. And his name is Jesus. And each one of us in here, logically speaking, we've been confronted with the truth. And we have to now make a decision. How are you going to walk away today? Allegiance to self and continuing in that or allegiance to the truth? And here's what I know. The way of Jesus, it's not always easy, but it is always good. 
It's not the easiest route. And in fact, I'll tell you, it's probably the hardest route. But it is better. It's better. C.S. Lewis, again, y'all have heard me tell this story again. It's probably my favorite line in all the Chronicles of Narnia. Little Lucy is following Mr. Beaver, and they're going to see Aslan, who's representation of Jesus, the Messiah. And it finally dawns on her that she's going to see a lion. And she says to Mr. Beaver, Whoa, whoa, wait, wait a second. Is it safe? And Mr. Beaver replies, Who said anything about safe? But he is good. But he is good. The way of Jesus isn't safe, but nothing worth ever doing in life was ever safe. And it wasn't easy. So make the, make the decision today. Who do you give your allegiance to? Let's pray and then Sue alluded to.